So that was a quite a fun debate I had with one of my uh, colleagues, Scott Kasner. He's also a good friend. Um, and um, essentially, we were taking um, different positions on the statement that antiplatelet monotherapy um, is the standard of care uh, for patients with ESIS. And um, this debate really has arisen from um, four negative randomized trials um, that have compared anticoagulation versus antiplatelet therapy in patients with ESIS. So um, the first two trials, uh, which were large, um, more heterogeneous populations of ESIS trials were Navigate ESIS and Respect ESIS, um, which tested rivaroxaban and dabigatran respectively uh, versus um, aspirin. And then subsequently, there was two um, studies that further phenotyped ESIS to patients that had atrial cardiopathy, um, and they had various definitions for this um, that I won't get into for the sake of time, and that was Atticus and Arcadia, both of which uh, were negative as well. Um, and thus, um, the question is, well, at present, um, is there um, is antiplatelet monotherapy the standard of care? And, and I forgot that the other portion of the prompt was, or is there room for other approaches? So um, quite poignantly and appropriately given the lack of hard randomized data um, to guide practice or, or guide anything other than antiplatelet monotherapy for long-term uh, in these patients, so my colleague Scott Kasner took the position that um, that antiplatelet therapy is standard of care. Um, uh, and then um, to try to debate this, I took a different angle. Well, the first is that although there's a lot of debate about whether ESIS is a valid construct, and the reason we're having this debate is because they haven't responded to more potent anti thrombotic therapy, that being anticoagulation with FACO10A inhibitors, relative to antiplatelet therapy. And if that's the reason to throw out the construct, well, we already have evidence that ESIS as a heterogeneous construct can respond to more potent antithrombotic therapy. And actually, that comes from the early um, acute um, stroke trials testing DAPT versus monotherapy, where patients were eligible if they had minor ischemic stroke, typically if presenting within 24 hours of symptom onset, um, and then more recently with Inspires up to 72 hours um, if they had atherosclerotic disease. And the majority of patients with ESIS will have NIH stroke scales of about one, so the median in um, the clinical trials in terms of baseline NIHSS in these ESIS studies was about one with the intercortical range of about zero to three. So actually the vast majority of ESIS will present with NIH source scales of three or less and would have been eligible for these studies. And the studies that have shown the proportion who entered the studies with ESIS, uh, and for instance, CHANCE2 being one of them, um, ESIS was about 45% of baseline participants. Um, and in the ones where they've looked at subgroup interactions, um, the patients with ESIS seem to have benefited similarly than patients without ESIS. And even in chance, there's some data suggesting that embolic appearing infarcts actually had greater benefit from DAPT versus aspirin. So already we have a heterogeneous population of ESIS. Forget that it was even more heterogeneous non-cardiomolic ischemic stroke together in these trials, but a group of ESIS in a head, as a heterogeneous construct has responded to DAPT better than monoplet therapy. So that kind of, I, in my view, throws out the argument that just because they didn't respond to anticoagulation versus aspirin, they can't con ESIS cannot continue to be tested um, and RCTs as a heterogeneous construct. And already we've accepted that they, they respond similarly to aspirin as a heterogeneous construct. So, so I, I think um, really it, we should really need to question the treatment that has been tested so far, FACA 10A inhibitors or direct trauma inhibitors, um, and not the construct as a heterogeneous entity, because I think if we find the right um, combination of treatments, we can have an effect there. Uh, and similarly to what we discussed um, after last year's ESOC, um, I think dual pathway inhibition 
is really the way forward for these patients. We already have some data from the COMPASS trial where patients that had stable, advanced systemic atherosclerotic disease who were uh, randomized to dual pathway inhibition with a low dose of rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice daily combined with aspirin, um, had a robust 50% risk reduction in ischemic stroke uh, during follow-up versus aspirin alone. And when looking at outcome events during study participation, the effect size on um, incident ESIS was the greatest um, with rivaroxaban plus aspirin uh, compared to aspirin uh, than any other stroke subtype. Um, and we're currently um, testing this hypothesis with a more novel um, and safer um, anticoagulant, and that's factor 11 inhibitors. Uh, we're testing asyndexian um, versus placebo on top of background antiplatelet therapy uh, in patients with non cardiomolic ischemic stroke enriched with atherosclerotic disease in the Oceanic Stroke Trial. Uh, this is a study that will have roughly 10,000 participants, and about a third of them will be ESIS, and, and we'll be able to explore this hypothesis further. Um, other arguments that I made in that debate about um, the fact that there's room for all other approaches that apart from early DAPT that we're already using a standard of care in patients with ESIS, um, there are certain subtypes of ESIS that we've now are getting more information on and, and are considering anticoagulation. Uh, one of those is that a subgroup analysis of Navigate ESIS showed that patients that had um, uh, left ventricular dysfunction, and this was predominantly due to hypokinetic or akinetic segments, uh, and and the these patients had EFs well over forty percent, so it wasn't a uh, a heart failure population, kind of less than thirty percent, which actually would, wouldn't even meet a definition of ESIS, but but really just people who have good, relatively preserved heart function, but akinetic segments. Um, Nav and the rivaroxaban 15 milligrams seemed to reduce the risk of recurrent stroke in that subgroup by over 30%, and this was statistically significant. Uh, of course, this is hypothesis generating, but at least leaves, leaves the door open for other approaches. Um, in addition, we currently don't know in terms of patients that have ESIS in the context of active malignancy, what is the best treatment and international guidelines allow for either antiplatelet monotherapy or anticoagulation. Now, the moderator of this particular session questioned whether um, active malignancy or, for instance, even um, uh, left ventricular dysfunction are adequate subtypes of ESIS and whether um, they're once you know they have these, whether they're retreases, but uh, the reality is that, again, that left ventricular dysfunction subgroup is not patients with um, like severe heart failure, is patients that have relatively preserved heart function and just have some akinetic segments that we overlook all the time. And then the other piece is that in patients with active malignancy, very rarely do they actually get a diagnosis of a prothrombotic state of malignancy, right? The, the vast majority of them, the... Um, the uh, active malignancy is found incidentally or as part of the workup um, once they come in, and um, it is uncertain whether it had any role whatsoever uh, and that there is no clear indication of a, a, a profound prothrombotic state in association with their malignancy. So um, and this is why I believe that these kind of different subtypes are true cases of ESIS. The one, I think, subtype that I presented that I agree with the moderator that really probably shouldn't be considered ESIS anymore is patients with PFO who are young. So in patients under the age of 60, whose ROPE scores indicate that the PFO was likely the mechanism, we have good evidence that we can mitigate um, their um, risk of stroke with PFO closure. Uh, verse, um, and in the closed study from France, there's even some suggestion that maybe anticoagulation would be preferable to aspirin in that context. I think now with the data that's emerged, probably a, a PFO in someone less than 60 is no longer really a, a, a ESIS. But over the age of 60, it's still fair game. We, most often, when we catch a PFO over the age of 60, it's very rare that that's actually the culprit and, and ESIS remains. Um, and then the last piece I, got the, I guess that I'd like to make is that which again further supports, I think, the potential role of dual pathway inhibition is that the majority of patients with ESIS don't have only one potential source. They have multiple 
um, low to moderate resources of emboli. So, the, and and predominantly that's a combination of non-stenotic atherosclerotic disease with something else. And, and some registry data have suggested that up to two thirds of patients with eases have at least two or more uh, underlying low to moderate resources, and a third have three or more. Um, so, in that context, when you have patients, for instance, that have a some non-stenotic athro and perhaps uh, some low to moderate risk cardioembolic source, like let's say a left atrial cardiopathy, I think in that case, a dual pathway inhibition approach where you have a little bit of an antiplatelet therapy, uh, therapy on board and a little bit of anticoagulant to try to address these potential competing heterogeneous uh, mechanisms uh, may be the way forward to have a, a, a one uh, therapeutic strategy for a heterogeneous uh, population of ESIS, because I think with current widely available technologies, it, it's really impossible to know for certain exactly where that uh, clot originated, although that may change to kind of 10, 20 years from now when we're using uh, pipette, not pipette, rather, by PET imaging to, um, to perhaps identify uh, where thrombi have originated or plaque rupture uh, and so forth.